Okay. Okay, let me start the recording. Great. Okay, hi to everyone. And uh, so let me, let's see, okay. So, so um, today we have the last lecture of uh, Celestial Amplitudes by uh, Sabrina. So uh, feel free to start whenever you want. So happy Friday, guys. Um, last time we were talking about um, soft theorems and we went a bit into different ways of thinking about how to recognize um, where we expect and then actually verifying that there were um, conformally soft theorems, so soft theorems and celestial bases. So let me just first remind us what our map is. So re recall that for massless scattering, basically a celestial amplitude is the following transform. Uh, Basically, uh, basically, our um, okay, okay. So this energy is going to be a coordinate on the null cone. So there's a direction for each of the particles, and then oh my god. So when I am now doing this transform, the point is to now find what features of, um, like basically what features in a CFT um, correspond to certain things in this amplitude and vice versa. So essentially one has two routes one can follow. Let me write that down. So there are two routes. So I say you know something CF about CFTs. And then you try to go to like what part of amplitudes like that is corresponding to. And then the other route, of course, is the other way around. So basically what we had so far is we were talking about soft theorems now in amplitudes, and we wanted to see what they corresponded to in celestial amplitude. So we already, from the point of view of how this paradigm, like this program was set up, if anything, we saw that there were a way to write um, soft theorems as currents. And so that motivated us to look for an object that we could say was a correlator of a CFT. But generically speaking, if you have some sort of relation like this, where essentially the S matrix is already somewhat holographic in the sense that normally, I guess what you'd say amplitudes people are doing often is trying to learn about bulk physics from how the scattering amplitude is behaving. And so this guy's a function of only on shell quantities. So in the same way, we're now trying to make it more of a position space, I guess, version of holography, a little bit closer to like the types of dictionaries that you have in ADS CFT. And then the point of doing that though, would be to hope that there's something about um, this structure here that when you do this transform somehow is more nicely like encoded in a way that we have like better control of or, or better guesses here. So if we can find say, um, how various cool properties of amplitudes turn into properties of celestial amplitudes, that's great. For instance, one option is like, I mean, obviously questions of unitarity here are gonna be less obvious here because essentially this guy, the, the time evolution is um, not gonna look the same as radial evolution here. So there's interesting questions that are um, like maybe surprising that it's a little bit of the mechanics that's a little, just like to, you have to figure out. Um, and then, here we know that we want to have like op operator product um, expansions and conformal block decomposition, etc. So one can try to find different CFT features and see well what would they mean for the amplitudes. So for instance, one example of that that we'll get to later on is of course like like what region of scattering are you are you probing for different things, etc. So so what I want to talk about right now is kind of continue with what we were doing before. So that I would say that the last time where we landed off. We were talking about currents on the CFT side, and then we wanted to see how they were encoded here. And it was less obvious because we knew that these were soft theorems in the momentum basis, so we knew where they were right here. But when it comes to um, what this integral transform was going to do to them, it was a little bit less obvious. So we wanted currents, but we didn't necessarily know that there would be a notion of um, like taking the soft theorem residues here and making sure that they actually would correspond to those currents, which we would expect like where they would end up being in this delta plane. So that was a nice exercise. The next thing I'm gonna end up going into today is going to be the collinear limits. So finding celestial OPEs and showing that they do probably collinear limit of scattering. So the before I get into that, I guess I wanna mention something that's kind of between soft theorems and 
um, between the soft theorems and this OPD stuff. And so that's because when we were writing down this word identity, so I was basically saying that if I take um, the omega goes to zero limit, the order omega to the zero term, um, and then do a certain like shadow transform. So I do these three steps. Then I was saying that when I put my, um, I put my uh, candidate stress tensor, which was written down in terms of these, so this gave me that. And if I put it supposedly in a celestial amplitude, then it looked like this ward identity, um, basically, so wait, let me erase it. It looked like I had my um, like sum over HI over Z minus VI squared, et cetera in the derivative term. So basically that combination, um, the fact that I had a word identity coming from um, inserting a soft theorem, note that this was coming from the soft limit and the amplitude. So the way that this was derived is you're taking the soft limit of this guy and then the soft theorem looks like this. But in a CFT term, this is a collinear limit. So one thing slightly funny is I guess it's because if I'm looking at massless scattering, the, the kind of the divergences that I get when uh, like amplitudes approach each other in the collinear limit, like is also mapping onto the soft behavior. So maybe like it, it what I want to say is it kind of is a nice uh, talking about the algebra of these soft theorems is a kind of nice interlude between the conformally soft theorem discussion yesterday and the um, the OPE discussion that we want to have today because we want to talk about the OPEs of any uh, dimensions guys, not like just special soft guys. But we're going to find out then that the limit says you go soft and up giving you nice non-trivial constraints on it because basically the symmetry algebras come from those. Okay, so what we I, 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 yeah. I think we I think we didn't see the derivatives. Uh, oh yeah, no no I I put dot 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 because they didn't want to write down a wrong sign. Sorry, let me just make this. Yeah, wait, so it's like what is it like the thing. Like, DZI ever. Right. Okay. So there's also there's a if you have a round sphere, there's a kinetic term. Um so hopefully I hope I wrote the right factors there. Um do, 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 do. I can double check, honestly. Um so so the the there's no spin connection term if I use my flat, so like so the lambda terms, um like zk k will go to zero if I use my parameterization one plus uh like zz bar. Da, da, da. So sometimes I put dot, dot, dots if I just don't want to like write all the components out, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. And also if you, just because I guess if it's brought up, let's make sure that we emphasize where this is coming from. So this one is coming from the fact that when I do a, um, a boost, um, basically I have this U du term in my, my vector field. So psi includes a term like this and it's times like D, D, DZ, YZ. Um, again, factors of two here. So when I write this vector field down, like basically part of it is going to be measuring um, like the, the boost energy towards a given direction. So that's where this H is coming from. And so the conformal weight was diagonalizing that wind energy. And also there's a rotation part of it too. Um, so this guy here is coming from the, the like the Y, like the basic of the flow along this, this little sphere. So you can see where um, the angular momentum components. So basically, right, like you have J nu nu in the soft theorem, in uh, soft theorem. And so this guy will have your rotation parts. And then also, it do, like you're doing the lead derivative flow of, on the thing. So, so basically, where this word identity was all coming from was from like those, how the soft charge um, looks in. Um, when it acted on these external particles. So all the terms are, are in there. So it's, it, the, the full TOP works out, but again, this is coming from the soft limit and the fact that basically the collinear um, behavior of it is dominating this. So essentially what's gonna happen now is we have the following. So I'm gonna define now currents. I'm gonna call them currents. So they're actually, um, they're, they descend to zero, but they're not, or they descend to contact terms and amplitudes, but they are not uh, always. So in this case, the, the example of this P that I'm writing down is not gonna be a primary, but as follows.
Okay. So let me just emphasize this. So when I have my celestial operator, it's is like the creation or annihilation operator for, um, so I'll, I'll write that down. So when I see this guy written out somewhere, I really mean that I'm taking the integral from zero to infinity of uh, D omega omega to the delta minus one of basically like A or A dagger in here of uh, a given host city. So the A or A dagger will correspond to in or out. The funny thing with soft theorems is that if it's incoming or outgoing, you're also gonna have the same soft theorem up to some signs for the, the, the Feynman diagrams. Um, so basically, like you know what the subject is. So the nice thing about it then is that this residue that I'm extracting out right here by taking this like limit and then like extracting it with this delta minus one or delta here, this is supposed to give me the residue, which is the, the conformal soft theorem. So it should factorize onto what we know as the deposition or the momentum space soft theorem with like out this Mellon transform. So this guy corresponds to the leading soft graviton theorem. This this guy right here to the subleading, and then we had to do the smearing in the celestial sphere to get us to the object that was the appropriate weight uh, to zero guy for the stress sensor. So this shadow transform will shift the, it'll take, um, so delta goes to two minus delta, and then j goes to negative j. So what happens is that, um, Right, you can see that this here is the opposite helicity compared to what we expect T to have. So this is getting flipped by this transform. It's a isom like it basically is, I guess, an intertwining two representations of um, the global conformal group here. Now, right, so, so the thing about that is like, so you have the shadow transform that's acting on these global quasi-primaries. And now I'm not now I'm saying that I can use these operators to actually construct the full set of um, BMS generator, so in particular, the full set of um, the um, Virasoro generators. So right now, there's going to still be no central charge in that algebra, but the nice thing about it is that um, there are places where you can have non-zero levels, and that comes from um, understanding better the symplectic partners of these modes. And um, if that's something people are interested in, I can refer to a couple of papers on that. But for now, the algebra that I'm going to get from these guys is not going to be centrally extended. But it's still going to be a nice algebra, and I'm going to write down all of the the modes for for it. So I'm going to define uh, as follows. Then what I have is I get, okay, so first I define my Laurent modes, and then the second thing that I want to do is I want to look at um, the commutator of two operators, and I'm going to define it as follows. So this this right here is the first step where I am trying to, like, so what I want to say is, like, the, the way that special CFT is kind of set up is that you know you have a you know that you can just do this transform on amplitudes. Maybe you don't know that you can't do it on like an effective amplitude, but it formally this transform exists, hopefully. And you can see what that would imply if you wanted to actually say it should converge and stuff like that. Then you also have machinery from CFT, and it's not always quite clear that this machinery applies. So for instance, I mean, obviously if you just start from all of your assumptions, you can be more careful there. Um, the first thing we run into is that like the, the, the low point correlators are gonna be more singular. We'll see that at the end. One other thing you run into is that it's not quite clear at the moment that the notion of radial quantization is going to match onto um, like what you'd want to be doing here. So, so what I'm saying right now is that like the understanding of the 2D Hilbert space and exactly we know how to construct it like, as inherited from the 4D from the operators that I was uh, was writing down. So the, what we did yesterday was I was trying to write down the kind of the way where you know what the object you're actually dealing with every step of the way, so long as you're doing like perturbation theory in the bulk stuff, but at some point, you want to try to see how far you can get using techniques that you know from CFT. So we're going to define a commutator as follows, which is just using the collinear limits to to give you um, to give you an algebra. So we do this one over two pi i, and it turns out it does give you the correct symmetries, which is good. So my contour is centered around the location z, and I'm moving one operator around the other. Great. So these guys will be the following algebra.
And so the way that one actually computes these commutators is literally using the culinary limits of scattering. So it's a perfect segue between what we were talking about yesterday and what I want to introduce today, which is going to be the collinear limits as OPEs. So I guess one little intermission before I um, just jump right into it, I guess is related to the, it was, the question was brought up yesterday also. So perhaps I can skip it. It was just also at the end of the section. So when I have, um, I'm taking the soft operator and I'm basically now writing it out in terms of um, different, like I'm literally taking whatever the soft name is telling me and expanding it into different modes that are defined on like circles and circling that operator. So these guys um, will actually, um, you can write non-trivial, if you have a global symmetric, for instance, okay, so, so let, let's see what happens when I insert this guy now. So, so typically what's gonna happen is I have whatever my, my vacuum and I have my, some mode acting on the vacuum and I have some operators here. So in the same way that you would do it in CFT, if I have some of the operators here actually annihilating the um, ordinary, just like if they would leave the Minkowski vacuum invariant, then they're also gonna leave um, basically this, this vacuum invariant for my CFT. So you can do the trick where basically now you have that, like you have a sum over transformations of each of the operators that gives zero. So we're gonna have uh, in the next section in particular, we're gonna have stuff of the form where we find identify extra global symmetries and I think that there's a nice diamond interpretation of how to, to see that. Um, and then we're going to see that there are ward identities that the correlators um, obey. So this is kind of the, the kind of the heart of why we want to use celestial CFT. We think that we have these soft theorems, that these soft theorems actually give us an infinite number of currents. And then we can use those currents to constrain the structure of the celestial CFT, not just to see, um, yes, there are soft theorems, or yes, there is like gauge invariance right in the bulk bike. We kind of know what the the from a very pessimist point of view, like the, the symmetries are coming from like different variants and from, um, from gauge invariants. But the fact that they can then be applied to like non-trivially like solve for OP coefficients and stuff like that is quite nice. And this is part of the power of why you want to use a representation for amplitudes that puts these front and center. So I'd say it's a starting point of a nice motivation for really going deeper into the subject. So, so what I want to point out, for instance, is that for each of our rotation generators, so for all of our Li and for the P mu, so let me roll write it in, um, in not in a weird, funny notation. So for all of my Lorenz generators and, and my, so all my Poincaré generators, I can basically know that they're going to act trivially on the vacuum. So basically I get something that like some sum over contributions um, I acting on each of the OIs within my correlator are going to vanish. So. Let me write that in a minute. So, and so acting on any one of these guys is going to be some sort of differential constraint. And then this is just a differential constraint that we wrote down last time before, where basically whatever, like you have like some omega i, d omega i, and you have some 2h or something like that. I'm going to be very schematic here because I don't like um, writing something wrong. So basically, we wrote them all down the first, second lecture, I believe. And so you can just also verify what they would be for the translations this is one of the exercises. And you're gonna see that these are basically non-trivial relations that this obeys. Now, one thing to point out is for the, for the, um, for the, these guys here, so for the SL2C generators, this is already gonna be trivially zero from the way that we've um, designed the conformal correlators. So like, you're not gonna get anything extra from that for the purposes of then what I was talking about, like finding new properties in the collinear limits. But because translation invariance is not made manifest on the celestial CFT from the structure of the, the boost eigenstates, you will get a non-trivial constraint here. And so in particular, the translation invariance will imply, and then you, the point is to derive it, um, the sum over uh, the delta where one of them is shifted. It goes zero. So that's nice. Um, yeah, so, so basically you start to get constraints from any of the symmetries beyond the ones where you built it in from the beginning. And we started second lecture building it in, or that's like the third lecture building it in. And then um, now we can kind of go from there. Great, okay, so the next section now is collinear limits. So basically there are two routes that one can follow. You have two options. Again, the first one is I start from the amplitudes, uh, so starting point. 
is, is basically the amplitude or symmetries. So I'm gonna do the first one because that's the one that's mechanically the closest to someone who's familiar with amplitudes, knows how they behave in the collinear limit and then go and look at the, the transform of it. So again, the kind of the standard procedure here that we've been doing in the last, last lecture and then today is that you have this integral transform done on everything and I can do the integral transform on part of the object. And you can then, in, in certain instances, you can see that it doesn't affect the rest of it. And so you can actually um, read off the, 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 in this case, the collinear limits, giving you the celestial OPE. So the, the punchline is going to be that celestial OPE are collinear limits. So, so this is in 2D and this is in 4D, I guess you think. Yeah. Okay. So say I have one other funny thing to keep in mind is there's there's some uh, mechanical. So in my lecture notes, I try to stick with the gravitational case just for consistency. Um, if you actually want to go through the exercise yourself, I would say that the um, Yang Mills case is going to be a bit easier. So so the spin one case is going to be nicer because you don't need to do a little bit of like can I send z to zero and not send z bar to zero. So there's something where it's I guess somewhat using you could say it's like. Tricks that you would use in 2.2 are analogous to what happens when you're trying to complexify each of the, the Z and Z bars separately. So, so there's a little bit of um, tact that has to be applied in the gravitational case, which I'm going to write out here. But if you want to just do it at home, I would recommend doing the spin one case. And that's also in this lovely paper by, um, by Pate, uh, Ray Clario, uh, Yen, and Strominger. OK. so. The first thing I'm just starting from is that if I take the limit as zij goes to zero, and so this is this is just like the leading term in the collinear limit. So right now I am um, like the spilling function will be just true, but the question of what I do with it, the fact that I recognize it as being singular is, is important. Um, so if I take this zij goes to the limit of an amplitude with a given set of helicities and momenta, then what I get is I get a sum of two splitting factors of so my split S psi J. It's a function of the momentum of those two particles. So two of these guys are like so right in my celestial sphere. I have two guys going close to each other. If I think of the scattering process as happening in the bulk, and this is like at infinity. So you're really going towards each other. And then this guy now is the amplitude with those momentum replaced. Okay. So now this variable here, let me define what my quantities are. So my P mu is going to be my PI plus PJ. Okay, so right, also one thing right now is an example I'm doing, I'm gonna do both of them are outgoing so that I don't have to deal with um, more subtleties there. And then the second thing that I have is um, that this variable I'm going to define later is, or use later, is, is the sum of the energies. OK, so given that, then the split function takes the following form. So this guy becomes these two, so split two, two, two. Because so each of these are gravitons, so it's just SI is split plus minus two, right? So P, I, P, J. And then similarly, um, two, two, two. And if I flipped all of the felicities, I can just um, change that. These, I'm only looking at the terms that are actually going to be singular in this limit. Okay, so one thing nice about it is anytime you see a quantity in the celestial amplitudes, it's just some power of um, of omega, then it's gonna like you know it's gonna shift the delta value of some transform, and then in this case, it's actually gonna be even nicer because. Um, with an appropriate change of variables, you can do part of the, we're going to show that you can do part of the Mellon transform that will not like appear in the rest of the amplitude. 
So the rest of this amplitude is going to like depend on these this omega p combination. And so we want to just basically change our like choice of variables and in integration so that that um, uh, integral over the variable that a still depends on is is left out. So I would say that that's you see that all the time. This stuff. So we saw in the stuff there, and we saw it. We're going to see it right now, and we're going to also see this. Um, as probably the cleanest way of writing the four point function is like basically just change the variables within the integral for the Mellon transform in a way that like makes the transform on like the covariant or invariant object that you know of the easiest. So like that's what you do like every time that any of the results that here are, are there. So just do that. And that's a good golden rule for this stuff. So what are we doing? We have I'm just like looking at the part of the transform acting on omega i and omega j. That's one, same thing. Um, so I'm, it's, I think it's worth to just write it out. So at first, like going through the step of this, j minus one. And so I have my split function. In this case, I'm gonna look at the two, two, two case because otherwise the other one is analogous and you can do it. Um, and this guy will equal um, negative kappa over two, v bar ij over z ij. So you can see that I'm just, the z dependence is just coming right from my, my form of the split function. But now I have to do the integral over this guy. And so what it turns out is if I make the change of variables, so the change of variables that I'm going to do um, are the following. I'm gonna set omega i to some variable t times omega p. I'm gonna set omega j, so basically simplex variables. So ironically enough, also a lot of the integral transforms that you're doing, you just end up going over to some sort of simplex variable. So right, so these two sum to omega p as we wanted, but the nice thing about this quantity t is that then I know that this, it's not gonna appear in this part of the amplitude. So it's just gonna um, be evaluated within the splitting function. So I have this guy and what I get is the following. So the t integral, gives me the following part that it isn't gonna to touch the rest of the amplitude. Um, sorry, not infinity to one. So the way that we find it, these quantities are also positive. Um, is zero to one dt t to the delta i minus one, one minus t t is all, that's all to the delta j minus two. And then the thing that's left over the important point here is what is the weight shifted at? So it's gonna be d omega p, omega p to the delta i plus delta j minus one, and then times the rest of the amplitude. So, so the only quantities, the thing to keep in mind here is that this is just a beta function. And it's a function of the delta i and the delta j. So we do the integral and it doesn't affect anything else. This guy will basically look like the amplitude without the two particles there. Um, so in this case, we know though from the splitting function, this is then the amplitude for another graviton with spin s. Um, but now it's Mellon transform quantity is, is shifted here. So what this turns into right now is immediately um, a statement about the collinear limit of our operators. So let's write what that is and then make sure that we don't get confused by any of the terms that we've written down. So the two things that we're doing, we're taking two outgoing, and I'm gonna still suppress the plus or minus levels, but they're both gonna be the same like outgoing guys. Delta one, spin plus two, it's at Z one and Z two. And then similarly, I'm gonna take the second operator B, delta two minus two, or sorry, plus two here, Z two, Z bar two. And then what I have is the following, is I have basically, negative kappa over two, z bar one, two, or z one, two, theta delta one minus one, delta two minus two of O delta one plus delta two plus two, z two, z bar two. And similarly for the, um, the other helicity case for the other splitting factors. So you can do this exercise twice and get the other one. So there are gonna be two um, collinear terms that are relevant for, for graviton scattering when they're both outgoing. And the one that we've written right here, we've, we've seen that we can evaluate because we have the following. We see that this guy is just by definition what it means to be taking the collinear limit within um, the celestial amplitude. So that this is the amplitude and then this is the celestial amplitude once we've transformed it. 
And then um, this guy here was giving us this beta function here. And then from this part, the shifted weight. So this object should be understandable. And the nice thing about it now is that basically, because we've separated out, like, so they have, so tuning omega turns into the analytic behavior in the delta i, basically. And then basically collinear corresponds to tuning zij. So essentially the same and almost like the same in both, um, roughly. Um, so, so the nice thing about that is basically now, like you would say, I would say that if anything, that there's something, celestial CFT is somewhat different in the way that we handle the spectrum than normal CFT, but in the collinear behavior, it's much more like a, a normal CFT. And the reason why I say that is that basically, um, right, like, so, so we're taking the collinear limits of scattering, we're getting nicely, like the behavior of the operators approach each other for like, if I just told you that my CFT had a set spectrum, um, this would be like the starting point of the data for that. The funny thing about the soft limits is that we're basically seeing like typically what would happen is you'd want delta on the principal series and that that would capture all of the um, radiative radiation. So like the outstates of the standard S matrix. But the issue there is that basically the, the way that we're learning about celestial amplitudes and the behavior of them is to say what happens when we take that object that's defined on that spectrum and then we continue the delta to different values. Um, and then we're identifying these soft theorems, et cetera. So in principle though, I think that one could take the very hard line approach and say like, okay, we're gonna use collinear limits of amplitudes to tell me what the CIJK are. So, so like, here's, here's like how um, one would try to define the celestial safety, I guess, is I'm gonna use my knowledge of collinear to basically give me all my CIJKs. Then I'm going to use um, the fact that the radiative states our principal series. And I'm going to hardline on that, maybe. Like, so there's kind of two. So say I just like said, I know this is my spectrum. That's what it is. I can still use the, like, the delta like, off the PS to give me currents and then use the global part of that to basically give me constraints. So, so in the sense that if I can use the, the behavior and the complex delta plane to tell me that I had this data function, whatever, because I wasn't just looking at it for specific values of things, then I could still restrict later on to the principal series. So I think that that's one attitude that hasn't proven wrong yet. Um, so we can, it's not like, because we're doing all this weird stuff with the spectrum doesn't mean that we can't eventually have a normal looking 2D CFT at the end of it. But I do wanna say that then there's the other approach, which is that like, okay, maybe in the same way that um, in like, certain CFT contexts, you deform the principal series contour and just pick up a bunch of highest weight states that are into like integer values of delta or half integer values of delta or whatever, or hopefully not just that, but like in this case, the 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 main, um, like the, essentially that all the poles are coming at special values of delta. So one could imagine that maybe there's another extreme where like the um, conformally soft sector of the theory or whatnot is governed by some simple CFT with like a maybe special spectrum. Um, so I think, what I'm, what I'm trying to convey to you is that like there are routes where like you definitely have objects in this that are like well defined. There's enough possibility for you to have some fun playing with it. Um, but I don't think that anything like everything that we're building up right now is trying to talk about like the, the important starting points. If I had a CFT and I wanted to define it, I want to know the spectrum. I want to know the OPE, and that's why we've done it in that order and spent the time that we have on it. So that's my mini rant there. So I then, have a question. Going, yeah. Um... Here you're using split signature, right? Uh, is there a statement uh, about OP coefficients uh, in normal signature? I mean, are these related? Are these the yeah, same? Yeah, so, so I want to say that I would say that it, in the... So in, in the spin one case, you can do it in normal signature for sure. The, I think, okay, so, so maybe what, what I want to do is I, I want to say that I am taking... Like, like, how do I want to say this? If you look at this, okay, so if you look at the splitting function, hopefully it's true that the, there is a universal term in this collinear limit. And the issue is just that you wouldn't notice it necessarily as diverging the collinear limit, right? So, so what I'm saying is, is that if you just give me, if you, if you knew the collinear behavior, like to all orders in collinear behavior, I'm not saying that you do, but say, say you do that, then I can talk about complexifying the Zs and the Z bars 
and then how that object would behave. And so like in one of the variables, so in this case, in the Z's instead of the Z bars, I have um, this poll and then I can find my commutators. So I think, I would like to say that I'm not really using, I don't think I wanna say that I'm using a split signature here. I wanna say I'm actually probably using more than that. I'm using the ability to continue off of, like which is stronger because it's not like it's just like the Z's have one reality condition and then they have another. It's like they can be complexified. I, I do think this is still somewhat active. Like, like it's like we're learning stuff about it actively. So I don't want to say something that I'm going to like say I don't agree with in a year. But um, but I believe that right now all I need is I would need a little bit more of the data beyond like collinear singularities. I need collinear terms that can have any singularity. So in, even in real signature, this is an angular. It's it's a funny. Um, like angular singularity, I guess you could say. And I, I thought I believe that the amplitudes that like when Taylor is driving is he's definitely staying in, in one three. I, my impression is that actually going to two two was used sporadically. And if anything, it was just like literally taking the tree level. Like for the, the first examples we were doing, we were just taking the um the fact that we knew that the amplitudes, the spin of variables look the same in the two signatures. I mean, not the same, but like like you could just change the the momentum they were using. So, so I think it, proper 2-2 technology was really only um, crucial in like the conformal block decomposition in terms of um, uh, the like the 2-2 paper by Anna and um, and others recently. So, like I think even though what I'm saying wouldn't be considered a singular term if I didn't complexify like this, it still should be there. Is that fine? Okay. Thanks. Right. Okay. So now, um, for the sake of um, this is going to be a bit more of a sketch than a derivation here of it, but essentially the the second route that one can follow is instead of so the, the relatively clean thing about this is if I know this behavior, then I have already my celestial OP. The kind of fun thing about it though is that these OPs are actually highly constrained, and so what I was saying before is that. The, the structure here, like, so, so I guess in my, my set of things you want to do, we had the study of the spectrum for the, the basis we have now, the collinear limits should be these this data. So if there's any way that we can have um, symmetries of correlators, then those symmetries will also constrain the, the parts of the correlators that are coming from um, like acting on the, 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 the operators you're taking near each other. So what I was mentioning before is that for, if I take the behavior of amplitudes as I take delta off the principal series, then I get extra um, currents and those guys, there will sometimes be um, global symmetries associated to those that will give me extra constraints. And so if I can write down those constraints and they constrain then also the OPEs, I can get recursion relations for these uh, OPE coefficients. And so I just wanna point out the, like advertise the route in that paper and um, they try to design an exercise that at least would like let you play with it a little bit more in an easier case. And so we want, we want something of the form. Sorry, uh, we want we want something like this. We want to say that there's some sum over our correlators, where if I vary one of the objects, then I um, add up all the variations, I get zero. And this basically relies that like delta of like my vacuum state is zero. So I want it to be a global symmetry for that to be the case. Otherwise, I essentially have then another. Um, insertion, which is would be of a soft graviton mode or soft, like it, it's a, it's basically a gold zone mode in the bulk. So the spontaneously broken guys are all of the asymptotic symmetries we were studying in the second lecture. And that's the ones that I guess don't give you the um, so simple constraints and just like, like there's nothing else added to this amplitude. It's just a constraint on the amplitude without it. So, so from the picture of the celestial diamond story, you can see that it's as follows. So my soft theorems were here. They descended to a soft operator here. There was then, then you had a constraint equation, which basically said that this was Q soft and then Q soft plus Q hard was supposed to be equal to not zero, but like it's zero after you take the future null infinity and past null infinity contributions and appropriately like subtract them. So given that, because this guy wasn't also a primary descendant. If I take that quantity and I smear it uh, with a function um, where basically if I integrated my parts on the sphere, I would get zero. Then you can see how you would build up global symmetries that way. So, so essentially what's happening now is that I am um, 
you, I, I'm trying to motivate how the structure that we spend a bit of time on, maybe like otherwise you might say it's erroneous, it's not in the papers like before, like it is connected to, to the story. So it's nice because basically now I am trying to use SLT C coherence or whatever to identify these spectral special values of the formal dimensions to find where they're going to be possible um, primary descendants where then I could have another operator that's um, being related to, to that operator. So basically the, the, the multiple structure is kind of identifying the spectrum here where that soft operator could be. And then we're also then, if there's another hard operator of that dimension, then the two of them can have a special ventricular relation, which has the potential to give me something like this. So essentially it's nice to try to, um, to use representation theory as much as you can to get, to get it to, 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 um, to get what you want out of the stuff. Great, okay. So the thing that I'm saying right now is that basically it turns out that the sub, Subleading soft graviton. Sorry. Gives you the following constraint. So I'm just going to write down the, the delta version of that. And the way that one derives this is to like the starting point is to literally look at the soft factors. And then when you Mellon transform the soft factor out, um, the soft factors typically just have like an integral power of the um, energies in them. So like that Mellon transform is gonna be like a shifted weight or something in the end. Um, so it, like one can follow those steps and find these, these guys, but it just didn't seem like the right, um, the best thing to do for the timing here. So. Anyway, it's worthwhile enough that it's a good teaser to, to get this, trying to do it too. Acting on O, same as one, just here. Okay, so you're using the soft theorem. So you're using the form of the soft theorem because the soft theorem is actually like when you when I when I tell you the soft theorem, the thing that you're writing out typically is actually the the way that it acts on the the hard particles. So you're kind of reading off actually like the the hard part of it, ironically enough. And that's where even though I'm saying that the soft part is going to go away, like the the soft theorem is telling you the hard part. So um, basically, that's how you would go about and get this guy. But once you extract, so so what I'm saying is that I think you could use the celestial dimensions type of thing to identify how many different symmetries I expect to have in that case. And then now I'm using the, um, like the form of the soft theorem here to find the hard charge here and then write it out. So these guys are all gonna give me global constraints. And the kind of funny thing about it too, so, like, so this begs the question then again of like, okay, so like, are there symmetries corresponding to all these soft theorems, right? So if anything, I would say this is actually more definite answer to the positive, even though I was wishy-washy yesterday. So in the sense that I can, um, do this action on each of my particles, then implicitly in the bulk, there probably should be some corresponding um, way to write it. And so often for like the ENM case, you can see that it's this gauge transformation that has like a certain new behavior in it. Um, so the funny thing about it is like, from the point of view of the asymptotic symmetry analysis, it may not be obvious exactly how, um, if one wasn't looking to find that particular charge, one would arrive at it. So I think that there is some nice, like there's something that this perspective is kind of, informing in that direction. So that's not bad. Um, just to kind of gel with a question that was asked before. So definitely there are global symmetries in that there is a, that you can assign a um, parameter to it. I think one thing, if anything, like is that the form of, like even like, like we're like the, the form of these soft operators isn't always the way that it's written out in this manner. So like for the Gravitino case, like we're um, writing it out now, um, you just, don't necessarily see the same notation that kind of highlights that there will be these extra guys, um, but they should be there. So yeah, in an answer to whatever someone was saying yesterday. Um, good, okay. So now when I have this, the next step is to show that these actions on each of the operators, well, when they act on the operators appearing within the collinear limit, give you um, a non-trivial um, constraint on these OPEs. So right now I'm just gonna say that it does. And then this is something again to, Part of the exercise is to show it for the simpler case of translations where this 
transformation is much simpler. Basically just shifting the weights. So what, I, what I'm basically saying is that once you have your symmetries, like your and every symmetry beyond the one that I use for the conformal invariance, the ones for conformal invariance won't give you anything further because they're, everything's designed to be covariant right now. Um, you're gonna have the following. And also a lot of this stuff ends up being like little group rescaling kind of guarantees some of this. So if I use um, basically the little group rescaling slash like dimensional analysis for the types of operators that can appear in my effective theory that would govern the collinear limits. Sorry, so let me emphasize, I'm gonna write it down, write down the onsets and then say, like outline how one gets to that onsets. Um, here, that's a two. Um, So in this case, it's just plus two. So, okay. so basically what I'm saying right now is that I don't want to say that I'm knowing what the coefficients here are, but basically, can I use an argument from like the terms that are the, my interaction Lagrangian, what possible terms can appear here? And, and I think that you can relatively straightforwardly see that you could justify um that like the like the sum of the conformal dimensions is is the same here um and then from your interaction like you can determine whether or not you'd be able to have terms that have, like change the spin here so basically you're using like you start with like, this the starting point from this point of view is that you still want to like break down all the possible like three-point interactions that you can have um kinematically i guess or like someone sense like little group consistently etc um you that will inform where you want to allow non-trivial coefficients here. And then the point is then to apply these symmetries to these guys and find what they are. So that step, I didn't get to go into too much detail right now, but um, is basically kind of using like consistencies of like the possible interaction braces you can have. And you can also check that like there's some, um, like it, it, it depends on the spin here for these guys, as well as the, um, the, dimensions of the, the, the fields compared to the dimensions of the, the operators that can give you these collinear limits. So, um, and that by that dimension, I mean like the scaling dimension in 40, not the, not the deltas here. So essentially there's an exercise where you would write down all the possible non-zero terms here. And then once you do that, you then apply these constraints. So let me write down that procedure so that at least that part is clear. So step one is you write down your possible effective theory, possible L interaction terms. Second thing that you want to do is you want to um, like have your symmetries ready, which I guess some of them, so I'm saying like those wise you would know like you would know all of these possible like constraints I mean before you're even talking about the the interactions here because a lot of um, yeah well, I mean it's okay, also good then the third thing you want to have so maybe the order here is a little bit off but it's fine. Uh, you want to write down from these guys, um, like the possible collinear, like singularities, as like z goes to zero. So z i j goes to zero, or similarly for z bar, i j goes to zero, and possibly independently. And then from that, you're basically then then you're going to apply it. So the fourth step is uh, apply two to three. Okay, so at least that that operation is is relatively clear, and then the point is is that like this guy here, so this guy on this guy, gives you some recursion relation that I wrote down in the notes, um, which is, I mean it's a little bit long to write down, but it's it's in the notes and it's basically that like delta one plus so I'll just write it down for the sake of showing the kind of the sites of recursions that you have to be able to solve. So it's a little bit easier to check that it works, such as the way I made it in the exercise versus actually you have to solve it yourself. Um, but uh, you can. And the fun thing about it, which is a very nice result from that paper, is that the solutions are basically unique where the uniqueness is set by, um, you have consistency of the recursion relations and then you have normalization fixed by the soft theorem. So it's quite nice that that works out. Okay, 
So relatively complicated, but one can see where um, basically the, the 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 procedure is 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 straightforward enough that like once you know how to do to the steps, it's general. So that's nice. Um, and so the beauty of that is that basically in this approach here, I think a lot of the results are just using tree level amplitudes to to, to like our MHV amplitudes even to, to find the, the splitting factors that you're using in, in practice. And while that the, so 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 I don't want to undermine like the like a lot of the earlier work or if anything like like the Taylor group did this very nicely early on. Um, and they have all of the like the culinary limits of the graviton operators. And when you just if you just have this part, you can jump to um, talking about symmetry algebras. So if if you said that I'm not going to think about all the work with these symmetries and how they give me constraints on my OPs and try to solve for them, I can get very far just by literally knowing on the amplitude side what to do. So I start on the amplitude side. Sorry, I'm going to use these. On the amplitude side, I do my transform. I get my collinear limits. I use these collinear limits. If anything, I can actually go beyond this leading behavior using the SL2R covariance of like in the in the Z variable, for instance. I can take the conformal uh, expansion beyond the leading collinear limit based on the covariance of these operators. So basically, like, it's like the analog of um, the full conformal block in that case. Um, so in this case, you can go to descendant terms from the behavior of the the the, the primary here. So I have a lot just from taking the amplitude and transforming it. In addition, what I have is I have the ability to then look at possible symmetry algebras of those guys. So if I can identify appropriate generators to define there, um, I can find non-trivial computational relations and actually try to find a symmetry algebra from it. So if anything, like the um, like the very recent interesting papers by Andy and then Guevara and, and Andy and others um, are basically looking at the collinear behavior of, of gravitons and like finding an interesting computation relations for the um, the modes where all the deltas are like negative integer values and those are the ones corresponding to these these like um, primary descendants we talked about but like the starting point there one could do it just starting from transforming amplitudes and not starting from like what possible interactions that I have etc so I want to say these approaches are very complementary so like in practice just doing the transform on amplitudes will get you pretty far like you can learn a lot about the celestial CFT but the nicer thing about kind of the setup that was in that um, other collinear limit paper is that basically they're trying to leave it more open. So like you can use, like how can Celestial CFT teach you about amplitudes versus the other way around? And that's really nice and powerful. So beautiful result. I recommend that paper highly. Um, okay. So that gets me, oh, okay. So <laughs> that gets me to the setup where basically, even though I like I love floor point functions, um, we probably are going to be short on time, right? Like it's five, five minutes left. So I'll set up, I think I can actually just kind of do a very quick outline of, of what happens. So so right now we've, we've done soft limits. We've done collinear limits. Now what happens in the UV? <laughs> Basically, what else can we do? What else can we say about what? So I would actually say the following. So I would say that we actually, I would say we're setting the spectrum was last lecture and we studied the OPE data this lecture. And so in some sense, the next thing to do is to like look at conformal block decompositions, et cetera. So you want to really try to take your yellow book, CFT book, go through it from like, okay, I know my the data of my CFT. What's the next natural thing I would do with CFT? And ideally, like this type of setup where you're using the the like using CFT consistency relations to evaluate conformal correlators as opposed to using Feynman perturbation, like the Feynman diagrams perturbation theory, is kind of like the hope that this is like another way to to kind of extract interesting data from amplitudes that doesn't rely on perturbation theory. So things that wouldn't be obvious from like all those uh, diagrams that you'd have. So the, um, the the reason why I then close the lectures with the four point amplitude is that basically that's the starting point for that. So I just want to point out that um, the, the in whatever time you guys give me, all I want to say is that basically my amplitude is the following form. It's some um, function of the PI and then the delta function for momentum conservation. Uh, Sabrina, I yeah. can see the, oh, I can see the okay. screen. Ah. Yeah. Sorry, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, it's a, so there's a delta function for momentum conservation. The first thing to note is that the, um, the, this will imply that the low point amplitudes are gonna be relatively singular. So one can try to avoid that with certain integral transforms um, to make the, um, 
the object's also primary, but basically, so basically you can change representations for the external states to make it so that the low point correlators are more like a normal CFT. But um, for the case that I'm gonna talk about here, I'm just going to lock it with the four point function because that's the most um, motivated by uh, what we've been setting up so far. It's like, you have the spectrum, you have the OPE data. Um, let's try to see what one would start from, like what's like this fundamental like four point scattering object. And the first thing to point out is that basically um, there is going to be one extra contact term. So I want to point out, so you have delta 4p here when you have a, uh, the scale integral. So if I take all of, if I, I'm just going to set up the integral transform one would do and then hopefully not spend too much time on this because I want to respect this time. So you can also freely cut them out. So if I do a simplex uh, integration here, this guy here will not, this formal momentum is not constraining the overall energy scale. So basically, um, my integral over the scale factors out, and I end up with a constraint for the sum of the sigma i. So basically, I'm going to get five constraints. So if I have two to two scattering, there's one constraint for the massless particle, which is going to be um, a reality condition on the cross ratios. So my guys are defined only on a circle on the celestial sphere. That's fine. One can show though that everything when you say like this object has to have a certain transformation property to be a formal correlator will still hold. It's just going to be a restriction on the independent degrees of freedom. So Z is going to be real now. But otherwise, one can show the following. One can show that if this for two to two scattering has the form where there's a kinematic factor coming from the litter group scaling, it's a function of the Mandelson variables. And then it's a for momentum conservation. That when I melon transform it, it turns into basically another kinematic factor, which is just the product of like the, so this right here takes into account the SIs. And then this guy is basically the analog of that adding in the, the deltas too. Um, so basically, right. So this guy is a product over say ZIJ to the sum over the Hs minus HI minus HJ, similar with the Z bars. So I'm going to be very brief here. Like I was just trying to my hands. So, then this is all multiplied by um, some uh, integral from zero to infinity d omega. And then it's also, so and then times this constraint that I was getting from the, like the reality condition of the, um, the cross ratios here. But the, the, the thing that I wanna emphasize here is that basically by doing the appropriate change of variables, you can, similar to the way that we were doing this integral change to go an integral over the omega p, if I do it now, I can do an integral over the Mandelson variable of this m. So the thing that I'm just trying to close off here with is that by applying the same technique where I have my Mellon transform integral and I wanna pick a convenient set of uh, variables to be integrating over. So in this case here, when I do that to the four point case, the, the convenient thing of course is one of the Mandelson invariants. So essentially what I'm saying is, is that my celestial amplitude can be written in terms of an object that's probing scattering if the Mandelson invariant is in different limits. So in this case, it's basically taking S, uh, it's fixed angle scattering, taking S to any value, and then that turns into analytic behavior in this beta variable, which is effectively like a conformal dimension for this S value. So the, the kind of teaser for where things left off, and so you have different routes forward from this guy. So you have, first of all, okay, I can start from this object and um, talk about a conformal block of composition. That's one route motivated from the CFT side of things. And from the amplitude side of things, I can talk about how the behavior of this, um, amplitude that I know in the S and T will now behave when I integrate over energies. So really like kind of the nice, like this is a nice closing point because you can see what the CFT person would do and what the amplitude person would do at this point. And thank you guys for your time. Okay, thank you, Sabrina. Let's give a round of applause. Beautiful lecture. So does anyone have any question? Maybe, can you briefly comment on the conformal blocks? I mean, I guess oh, yeah. these are different compared to the normal 2D conformal blocks because I guess the Casimirs uh, should be the Poincaré Casimirs in this case. In, right? so, so that's a funny thing. So I think that in the end, like I would say that, that that's probably the safest route. You can still artificially decompose things in terms of this subgroup being the, the Lorentz transfers, but then you're going to get basically singularities because you're summing over um, an infinite tower of delta. So I want to say that from the point of view of people trying to just make the conform blocks happen, you end up having this tower of delta 
that is equivalent to enforcing translation variance and basically using conformal the, the, the right blocks which would be the Poincaré blocks. I do think though, like the you should be probably using the Poincaré blocks, and that's the same way like the Zotnikov was was advertising or promoting. And so one would maybe the the best version of this will end up being somebody taking like Gade's result using Poincaré blocks and then writing it out. So I would say that um like the paper that like by Anna and, and, and collaborators and Andy is using two two signature um two, because they in that case there's an inversion formula that actually is clearly giving you the right uh, singularity structure here. So right this z equals z bar is a light cone. So it's like it it's supported on what would be a light cone in um there's so a light ray in um in, in this two two celestial sphere. So um there so there's various okay I can I could go on in different ways. Oh, that's interesting. But um, in that context, like they're literally doing still like the SL2R decomposition there. They're not doing a Poincaré version of it. So you can still write things in terms of these 2D, uh, like the, sorry, the, the 2D conformal um, symmetries. But I agree with you that the right thing to probably do would be to use the full Poincaré blocks in the same way that one would want to use Verisour blocks instead of global conformal blocks type thing. So like, yeah. Okay, and the status is uh, how, uh, to which extent are these known? These, to which extent, okay, so <laughs> I would say that there is it's under progress, let's just say that. So so basically the, the kinematic, like it's it's guaranteed to, like you, you run into technical issues probably because obviously you're, you're, you're working with the wrong blocks, honestly, um, oftentimes. Now there is a sense in which, because, okay, so the so, so I want to still think of it as a 2D CFT with Poincaré box is probably the right attitude because I don't like you get like another thing that can confuse you is like should I be really going to like some sort of 3D null manifold and really like you know like that type of stuff but I think that the the symmetry currents and structures point to that you really do want to think of celestial sphere but you want to think of an extended symmetry group so I think that the technical issues you run into are basically because you're looking at um, probably SL2C blocks instead of Poincaré blocks but you're just decomposing it the wrong way and so. Like it's no, I think it's known that it has to work, and a lot of people are trying to make it work. But that's the status is basically like hypergeometric functions suck. I mean, we're like, like, like sorry. Like, yeah, and there's some prescriptions for things that are just nitty gritty. But yeah, so hopefully, hopefully soon. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you guys. Uh, can I ask you, but it's more a curiosity than a question. Yeah. Uh, is there any generalization for uh, um, space-time that are not for uh, any four yes. dimension? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so what I want to say is that it's not clear to me what the... Okay, so let, okay, let's take a step back. I would say that the the way to generalize to higher D isn't... I mean, it's, it's the same... It starts the same point. So it starts with like Lorentz invariance versus... Um, like the conformal invariance in two dimensions lower. So that part's fine. So the kinematics of the global part is okay. The way that one would go about trying to find these um, these soft theorems, like so you can find null state conditions. So if anything, the, the celestial diamond story, like the first paper that inspired that was this work by Banerjee and they were actually looking at higher D, first of all. So you see a little bit of a different structure because basically you don't have like the, the two independent helicities. So the representation theory for where you can have a primary descendant is a little bit different. But if you go through that procedure, you should be able to identify the same structure of like, um, basically like the soft theorems correspond to the fact that like the, the like the mass, like the, the, the nominative modes of the metric. So like the like the part that should be capturing the, the boosted bonding masses or the angular momentum aspect have fewer degrees of freedom than the, the radiative guys. And so you need to knock down by like these descendants essentially. So like, that's why there's these helicity relations where like um, in, in 4D you're seeing like positive and negative frequencies are like related and in, in, in higher D it's a little bit like this, it's just they're in the same multiplet anyway. So it's a little bit weirder, but you do, you see the same structure where you have the soft guy. And so in principle, you do have a spectrum of dimensions, I think. And then I think you can then make the same argument about global symmetries coming from the dime. I, I think that should extend to, to higher D. So what I would say is that even though I think you wouldn't have the Ursura, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't have the analog of all of the symmetries you end up actually using to constrain correlators. So, so like the, the LN modes, useful for defining the primaries and then talking about like 
the Vero, if I wanted to, if actually, if I understood how to do conformal block decompositions, then having Vero Sorbo blocks as opposed to global blocks would be better. But a lot of the structure with like the these like this differential equation for the for the um, celestial LPs coming from a global symmetry, I think that that would still exist in hierarchy. So there's a lot of stuff that will carry over, but I think I think it's going to be a little bit less interesting once. Um, like if we had a value for the central charge right now, then I definitely like a lot less interesting. I think the fact that there's like a zero central charge issue, it makes it so like if to the extent to which only the global symmetries are really being very, very much used right now, that would be the same in higher D is what I would say. But there are non-trivial levels that you get from understanding collinear limits and the, the, the goldstone and the memory modes better. Um, so I think that once you postulate a non-zero central charge, then the 2D stuff really helps. So I mean, only I was sorry when I say that, um, I mean, because like I want to use zero zero blocks and then there's something funny there with the, yeah, okay. not because you wouldn't have a central charge in the other. <laughs> yeah. Maybe connected to this, you mentioned mm -hmm. higher Ds, but how about D equals to three? Do we expect a Please. one D CFT there? Yeah. Maybe this yeah. could so, be simple to study. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so I think the thing that used to freak me out before is that I was like, well, there's no soft graviton. What do I do? You know what I mean? But there is edge modes, right? So the boundary modes are. So, so one thing I think that I was, um, like if anything, I, I used to be more dismissive of it because of this, like everything was starting with the soft name, but really the soft theorems are encoding the goldstone modes for the boundary. So you really should be able to just go down. Um, and like, I think that in that case, you would probably only have the conformally soft sector. So you'd have the analog of, um, or at least maybe very roughly, I would guess that you would have like all of the, the modes that correspond to like the diffeomorphisms of, of the boundary would basically be the analog of like the goldstone modes that we have, which are coming from the delta, special values of delta in the bulk. So maybe it wouldn't surprise me that somehow like if you look at celestial CFT in 4D and you looked at only like the delta, like equals zero and one modes, basically like that type of structure is what you only think you'd have in 3D. I mean, okay, so I'm being very rough there. Um, so in principle though, yeah, I don't, there's nothing that stops you from doing the same like melon type transform. And then I think I would know what the the global, like the, these these diff modes would probably have to be something like that. So I probably, you probably could, yeah. Okay, it seems uh, there are no other questions. Otherwise we can give another round of applause to